my pleasure and uh, privilege to introduce Chayan. Thank, thanks for coming. Bye. So, so thanks, thanks for showing up, I guess, and uh, uh, thank you, Indika, for inviting me here. And um, this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about work I've been doing with uh, various colleagues, and the title is uh, Modeling Complex Phenotypes. In a way, this is a little bit of a kind of play on uh, two versions of complex phenotypes. So the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about complex phenotypes very much from the perspective of a kind of quantitative genetics, statistical genetics perspective uh, in that tradition of what we mean by complex phenotypes. In the second half of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about how we get towards trying to do genetics of shape. And here what I mean by complex phenotypes is a more, for lack of better term, uh, form and function perspective of phenotypes, this being things that are like brains, ankle bones, uh, hearts, right? The, these types of phenotypes. So, and so that's going to be the, the, the two parts of it. So. so the first part, again, is quantitative genetics. Very classic idea is lots of people ask questions about, okay, how heritable is height? This is a very old question, various answers of this. And more and more, what we're realizing, what we care about is a lot of phenotypes. I like dogs, uh, for example, dogs, right? There, there are many different uh, Really, there are lots of traits, and we understand jointly how these traits are behaving. And so, kind of a classic idea in quantitative genetics is if I give you 15 traits, 20 traits, 1,000 traits, right? Um, if I give you a phenotypic variance covariance matrix, how do I break that up into a genetic part and an environmental part, which is just what we're talking about here? The classic notion is something called broad sense heritability, the genetic effects on the phenotype. And that can be further partitioned into more fine ways, things called additive, dominant, and interaction effects. And a very kind of classic version of this, and this is, uh, goes back to something called Fisher's fundamental theorem, and is that the only the additive effects can be passed from parent to offspring. This is called narrow sense heritability. And under this model, uh, the rate of increase in fitness is equal to its genetic variance in fitness at that time. So a uh, way of writing this down is this is called the breeder's equation is if i have a measure of fitness h squared if i have a selection differential between two phenotypes if i ask what the response to selection will be this is the formula okay and this is just really just partitioning the variation now if you ask about the multivariate version of this you get something very similar if you assume that your traits are continuous okay you can think that this comes from a, a from a normal covariance matrix. And then what you get is this equation, right? Where if, uh, again, I said my choice, pretend they're uh, multivariate normal. So S is now a selection gradient. It's a direction that you're pushing towards in terms of the phenotype space. And now what we call delta Y is the change, right, in the, in the response. And we're saying it's mediated by this uh, matrix G, which is a matrix of additive genetic covariance. And so the point is, if you push in a direction, that's in the null space, right, or orthogonal to G, you will not get any response. So this is very important for breeders for very obvious reasons. Okay, so we're going to think about and talk about how we can infer this G matrix given data. And this is kind of a classic problem in, um, in quantitative genetics. So previous approaches have been trying to do clustering approaches, method of moments, and the most common approach is what's called the linear mixed model. And this is the approach that is used for most cases because you can use it when you have design studies. You could use it when you have actually design breeding or in the field or even random. And so the question that we asked is, is there a way of extending this linear mixed model and scaling to thousands of traits? So that's a basic idea. So just as a picture, my traits are gene expression. And more and more, we're looking at things like proteomics, We'll come back to maybe even more for metrics, right? How do we take advantage of these more complicated traits that we're measuring a bunch of them simultaneously? So one idea is you can reduce the high dimensional data into some underlying structure. This is gonna be where we start talking about factor models. You can estimate possibly evolutionary patterns, parameters, this is these estimates of heritability. We want to be able to handle complex experimental design or complex pedigree. And we want it to be scalable to large number of traits. Okay, 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a Bayesian method, and we're going to get a sparse estimation of this G matrix. And it's based on something called an animal model, which I'll write down for you very soon. Okay. And the application is going to be the gene expression of the cell. So one of the ideas is that if I look at gene expression, in some loose way you can think about it's broken up into different parts. There are different cellular activities that give rise to gene expression. And so maybe it's reasonable to think of this as a modular process. So in this context, these are my phenotypes. This is, this is what's called the animal model. These are my phenotypes. These are my fixed effects. For example, this could be gender, could be whatever else you're thinking about uh, modeling. This could be the random genetic effect. And this is just a residual error. So you can think about this random genetic effect comes from a multivariate normal, mean zero, and its covariance is this G matrix, right? This is my additive genetic variance covariance. So that, that's your model. Now, one way of thinking about that from perspective of development, you can say, well, this is decomposed into some factors. This could be from one pathway, the poor pathway, or the RB or P53, and then we have some extra noise. And so the idea is these are sparse. There aren't many factors. There aren't many developmental pathways. And then what we're saying is in each pathway, we have not that many genes uh, affected. So that, that's going to be, loosely speaking, our notion of the biological model. Now, if I think about this, right, I have these, these factors. And what you can do is you can say that you have loading. So basically, you're taking a linear combination of these factors to explain the additive genetic variance covariance uh, that you have. So you have genes by pathways. This is my loading. And then again, we're saying there are very few uh, parameters to estimate. Okay, so going on. So you can think about this. This is my measured trait. This is my loading. These are my underlying traits, and this is additive noise. And so from this, you can pull out the, this covariance matrix. So we're going to be using a Bayesian model to do this. So my, I have my likelihood, this is my data, this is my a priori uh, assumptions on these uh, uh, genetic covariance matrices, and this is my prior. And so we can write down the animal model likelihood in the following way, which is I have, um, <clears throat> I have a normal model, and then what I have is in one direction, right? This is, a, this is for any individual, if I look across the trait, they're explained by this G matrix. This is an additive genetic variance covariance. And now if I look across individuals, they're related. And this matrix A is sometimes called the kinship matrix. This is how they're related. So if you know the, the kinship structure, or if you have genetic data, you can again infer this. So this is the information that you have. So for a single trait, this is just what I said. You can write down this, is, uh, this model. And then what you can do is if you think about multiple traits, you can just extend this up. So what you have is this is now a matrix. And B is a matrix. It's also what you're saying is that uh, Y is the n by p vector of the measured trait. U is coming from our um, is the genetic part. And then E is just the environmental noise. And now these come from what's called a matrix variant normal. And this is just a generalization of a, of a multivariate normal. And what you're just saying is this, uh, you're drawing a random matrix. It's got a mean parameter M, and it's got two different covariances. One is for the, the rows and one's for the columns. So one's for the relatedness, and one is for uh, the, 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 how the traits are related to each other. Well, yeah. This, this is where, yeah, this, yeah. So this is, this is called, but the formula for this is it's a matrix variant normal. So then you write this down, and this is the hierarchical model that we're going to write. So we have a model for the U's and the E's. Uh, these are for the environmental part, and this is going to be coming from the genetic part. We write them down as factor models. The factors are again coming from this matrix variant normal. And then the key is that our factor loading, the way we load these factors, we're going to impose a prior on them, which will make these sparse. So that's, that's the key part. Now, then you can further partition the part that's environmental and the part that is uh, genetic. You can think about these in terms of diagonals. And so just for specification, you can just rewrite it this way in terms of, this is your estimate of heritability. So you can think of it as an identity minus the um, environmental part. And so this again is a notion of narrow sense heritability. You're looking at how much variance is explained by the genetic component 
divided by the amount of variance explained by the genetic component plus the environmental component. Okay. So again, this is just stating we can recover these uh, the, the matrices. We can recover G, which is the add additive genetic variance covariance. This is the environmental partition of the variance covariance of the trait. And then from that, you can even get back your estimate of the phenotypic covariance. So this is the idea. The idea is that um, what I want to do is I want to model the sparsity of this covariance matrix by modeling the sparsity of the loadings. So the first thing we're going to say about the loadings is that as I move down the factors as I move down from one row to another row, the weights, the, the new, the, how big the numbers are in each column are going to go down. And it's going to go down according to this function. And I'll specify that in a second. And the other thing is within each column, I'm going to put down a heavy tail distribution, which is going to force most of the elements to be zero. Okay. And then the residual variance is going to again decay as we go down the diagonal and it's going to, if I order them, and it's going to decay like this. So more formally, this is what this model looks like. It's a multi-level model, so things are normal, and it's got these two different parameters. This tau parameter is what's uh, shared across each column, and what it's all it's saying is as I move down the columns, right, shrink down the values of the columns closer and closer to zero. This sigma parameter is based on columns and on the indices, and that's what's basically imposing sparsity within each column. And then now this is just specifying how we get these sigmas. And then again, the reason why these tau get smaller is because we're basically multiplying things less than one as we move further down. And we put a prior in terms of the heritability, which is just a point mass prior, which uh, was taken from um, some work that Zhang Zhou and Matthew had done. Um, one, one thing I'll note is, this type of animal model is also showing up more and more in statistical genetics. And, and then this was a context where they used it. The remaining variables we just put down standard prior. So in a case study, what we actually looked at this in terms of data is um, there's a cross that was done uh, from Drosophila. They were taken at the farmer's market in Raleigh, North Carolina. And a cross was done. And we had 40 lines. And in this case, gene you measure gene expression, they measure gene expression over 10,000 genes. And they also measured seven fitness related traits. I'll come back and tell you at least what two of those traits are. And so one example was, um, this was a previous analysis done using a clustering method. So the clustering method is nice, but if you look at this matrix, it's actually not positive semi-definite. It's not a proper covariance matrix. But they looked at 500 and 355 genes that were correlated with uh, starvation resistance. And this was their estimate. And this is our estimate. And the point is that we get very similar estimates. You can, yeah. So this is a correlation matrix. How many samples? So this is a covariance matrix. And what you have is you have 355 genes and you have 40 samples. OK? OK. And so again, you can fit pretty large matrix with not that many parameters. And the point is, you can, and we do recover through covariance matrix here, they do not. Now, here's another example. Um, you get these loadings back in the estimate, and factor one is dense, but you see the other ones are not. If you look at some of these factors and you do a kind of correlation analysis to see what types of gene sets these correlate to, you'll find that these are correlating to defense and immune responses. And one of the things that's interesting is you can look at um, these are the top genes in factor two. So if you look at factor two and you ask what are the genes most correlated uh, with, with the response, right? This is what you get. And these are 95% credit, credible interval. And again, the thing you see is that while any gene itself may not be very strongly correlated, the factor itself is much more correlated. So I just wanted to show you one other example. Again, 414. Now we looked at a, another fitness measurement called competitive fitness. So you take the Drosophila, put it in a little jar, put a bunch of them in, and then keep them in there for, I think, a, I think a day or two. And then at the end, you see the counts of which of the lines come out, right? And this gives you a notion of the competitive fitness of them. So again, we use the same model. 
use the fixed effects of sex and random effects of the sex by line interaction. And let me just go through this. So this is going across, this is a heritability across the gene, okay, that we looked at. This is again our estimate of the additive variance covariance matrix. And what this is, what we're looking at is the genetic correlation with fitness for each gene. So you can get an estimate of that. So this is what's happening on the gene level. Now we can do the same thing on the factor level. So these are my factors. As you see, they're going down uh, in magnitude, they're ordered in magnitude. Um, I'm showing you how the loadings are for on these each of these latent traits. Okay. And then what I'm showing you here is each of these factors. I'm showing you how each of these factors are correlated with fitness. So it turns out factor two and factor 16 are correlated with fitness. Now, what you make of that further is a little bit tricky, but the point is again, you can actually pull out of these models possible factors that are that are related to fitness. Um, we have software, um, and one of the things we've been doing now is an interesting and challenging possible problem is getting estimating the covariance matrix is not horribly hard. I think we can do that okay. Trying to get an exact estimate of the number of factors is extremely hard. And if you want to do that, that's tricky, and I think there's there's some subtleties there which I'm happy to talk about. Um, one of the things we've been working on recently, which I think is interesting, is currently if I take a factor or a covariance matrix, I can look at the subspace that it's been. And let's say I take another environmental situation, right, get another covariance matrix, and let's say the subspace it spans is of a different dimension, right? How do I compare these? How do I measure distances between subspaces of different dimensions? Or how do I model these types of uh, structures if they have different dimensions. So that's a problem we've been working on and I think we've made some very interesting kind of recent progress in. Um, other things you can get estimates of response to selection. You can look at percent variation variations in fitness. And one of the ideas that's really interesting is incorporating this type of thinking into GWAS. If you go back and if you read Fisher 1922, right, where he talks about the infinite alleles model, you will see him talking about these types of models, both for quantitative genetics and for statistical genetics. And I, you know, plus or minus, sometimes around the 50s, I'd say, these two fields, you know, went away. And now they're really coming back together. And I think it's really interesting to think about how you can incorporate this quantitative way of thinking about uh, partitioning variation with more classical GWAS. And I know there are people working on that, but, you know, I think that's, that's a really, interesting problem. Um, so, okay. Um, so, and then, and then this is a very interesting thing. What, how, how do you think about discrete traits and time varying traits? So, if you look at back at the Landy equation, right, it had this thing where delta y is equal to g times uh, that response gradient, right? And this we know is true for continuous traits. But a question about is, what happens if you have discrete traits? What happens if you have multinomials in terms of flowering color, right? How would I go back and derive a similar equation? Would I work in a latent space? The classic models have been doing looking at thresholding models, but you know there might be something robust with respect to some type of latent space. So that's also, I think, something that's really interesting. And more and more, um, people are looking at time varying traits. So if something happens early in life, how does it affect the, you know, older age? later in life effects, uh, if you're looking at development of plants, right, and you want to understand, you know, what your seed, distribution of seed crop is, right, thinking about those problems, again, I think there's some really, really interesting ideas in time varying traits. So that's the first part of the talk. Now, the next part of the talk is a little bit different, but uh, I will relate them at the end. And I have a colleague, he gives me books. Okay, specifically, he gives me primate bones. Actually, he doesn't give me the bones. He gives me CT scans of the bones that are meshed. Okay, so we have 106 uh, bones from primates. Some of them are extinct, some of them are extant. And what we want to do is measure distances between them, but what we want to do more is understand their evolutionary history. Now, there are two ways of thinking about this. One way of thinking about this is you can, if you can take the bones, you can construct a matrix. From that matrix, you can possibly get a tree. So you have a species tree in terms of the phenotype, which is a bone. You can compare that to the analogous species tree that you'd have from the genotype, 
And if there's something you know, different in those, possibly that could be selective pressure. A little hand waving, there's great desire to make that more formal, but that's an idea. So that raises a question, how do you measure distance between shapes, surfaces, okay? So my colleague, Doug, had been working with another colleague of mine at Duke, Ingrid Dobashi, to do this. And the way they were doing this is, loosely speaking, you can take a tooth and turn it into, a, I guess, a disc tooth or a spherical tooth, I'm coming joking. So you can do a conformal map. You can take the tooth, put down a bunch of points in that tooth, take a little disc around them, and then basically, in a way, flatten it out in a using a particular map such that angles, right, volumes are preserved. And then what you can do is you can do this to a bunch of teeth. Once you've mapped it down, flatten it out, you can basically measure the distance between these maps using something called a variational distance. So this is what they've done. It's really beautiful work. It's, it's really nice and it's really elegant. But the problem happens is, what happens if your shapes are not isomorphic? If something breaks. So for example, if I have broken clots, right? Because fundamentally, if you don't have a map in those methods, they'll fall apart. So that's the question we started asking. What can you do then? Other examples of this is if I have fruit fly wings, I look at images of them, and suddenly something qualitatively changes. Right? Under one environment, they get an extra load. Right? What do I do then? What do I do in those settings? So that's, that's a question we started looking at. And uh, the approach we took is using something called integral geometry. And I'll explain what I mean by that really soon. But there have been these older ideas, these things called Hadwiger integrals, Minkowski functionals. They're examples of something called Euler integration, which I'll show you an example of really soon. And the classic example of this is something called the radon transform which is how a lot of CT scans actually work, okay? And roughly the idea is you take an object, a bone, and you're basically going to take, scan it through and ask how much mass gets through, okay? That, that's roughly the idea, but I'll make that more formal. Um, so the way we started thinking about this is there, is there something geometrical or more specifically topological? Are there summaries of these surfaces that we can use to kind of characterize it? that we can write out the surface instead of having something which is really complicated, can I transform it into something simpler, right, that I can then use to compare distances between. Okay, so one idea, there's something called Betty numbers, which are just how many connected components are there. Um, Betty one is how many holes are there. Betty two is the number of voids. Another summary that you can use, and we'll actually use a version of the summary, is what's called the Euler characteristic, which is alternating sums of Betty numbers or the number, if you have a 3D mesh, it's the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. And just to show you that this is a topological invariant, it's going to be zero for all of the tori. For Swiss cheese, it's always negative 34. It depends on the Swiss cheese. But uh, <laughs> for any solid object, it's going to be two, okay? So one that we use was, well, one that we also used is something different, but let me explain it to you. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a second about something called persistent homology, but just to motivate it, there's something called critical points. If I have a curve, it's got a minimum, maximum, it's going to have an inflection, and these are called critical points. Now, what we're going to do is, this is called Morse theory in one slide, okay? I'm going to take this function and just think about raising water up this function, okay? I'm just going to think about filling it up, and I'm going to ask when the sublevel sets change. When do the connectivity of the sublevel sets change? Is a question I'm going to ask. So the first point is here. You suddenly got a feature, and so we call this a burp. So I, something just started here. Again here, something else started. Again here, we had a new feature. When I go up a little bit further, that feature is gone because it merged with this feature, right? So this little feature disappeared up here. So that feature didn't live very long. It was born here and it died here. And we can similarly just scroll up this thing and we can look at when these topological features are being constructed and when they're disappearing. This is just for connectedness or that is zero. And this is what's called a persistence diagram. It's basically giving you a topological scan of the object. Okay. Now, another way you can think about it is if I have data, this is a time series, I can take little windows of it. Each window gives me a point cloud. Now I can take these point clouds and I can start thickening them. This is called the filtration, because as I keep thickening of them, I get proper subsets. And I can ask you, 
when does something change topologically before we're looking at connectedness? Now I can also ask you about cycles, right? When do I form cycles? Well, right here I formed a little cycle, right? That won't last very long. This bigger cycle is going to last long. So I could have made that same picture for the cycle. And formally, this is just what it is. This is a filtration. These are these things getting thicker. And I can ask, when do the homology groups of these things? So the point being is, if I give you two of these diagrams, this is a function. One is in blue, one is in red. I can give you a persistence diagram for each. And the ways of measuring distances between them. And the distance is really, what's the L2 distance from moving a red dot to a blue dot, right? And if things don't match, you move them to the diagonal. And this is just called an L2 Wasserstein metric, sometimes called an earth movers metric, but it has a formal metric. Okay, so now let me tell you what we actually do. Okay, so the idea is I take a surface, I take an object, I take a plane, and I'm going to take the perpendicular to that and run it right through the object. Okay, and I'm going to do it from any direction. So if you do it with the persistent topology, I have a simplicial complex in RD, so in three dimensions. I'm sampling from all the directions of a sphere, or as many as I can, okay? And so take a direction um, B, okay? X is my simplicial complex. Okay, and this is actually, I'm sorry, this is a persistence diagram of dimension K. But what are you doing? You take a direction V, you move R into it, right? You're looking at the sublevel set below R, and you're looking at uh, the persistence diagram as I move through it. And so we call this a persistent homology transform. It's a map from all of the directions into a bunch of diagrams, one for each direction. And you also get them for Betty zero, which is connectedness, Betty one, which is uh, um, holes, and Betty two. Now you can take <clears throat> these meshes, and now I can define distances between two surfaces. Basically, I can integrate over all of the directions, just the distance between these two objects, and sum it over the different dimensions. Um, you can do something simpler, which is sometimes good. You can take a simplicial complex, okay, or a mesh, and you can do the same thing that we did before, but you can compute something called the Euler characteristic curve. And let me show you a picture of that. that that's a little bit easier. So this is a mouse embryo heart. This is one of our directions V. Okay, so we've gone up to the point A. We're looking at all of the sublevel sets, all of the meshes in the sublevel set. And I'm asking you, what is the Euler characteristic of that? Which is the number of faces, a number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. And so that's that number. Then I move a little bit more, compute that number. That gives me this curve. What I've done here is I've taken this curve, I've integrated it, and then zero mean it. And you'll see why I do that next. Now, there's, there's a classic notion of a sufficient statistic, which basically, if P of X is a sufficient statistic, it's something you can compute from data. That means that your distribution of X given P of X and your parameters is equal to X given P of X. You can throw out the parameter. So the classic version of this for a normal distribution with known variance, just the sample mean is a sufficient statistic. So the first thing you can show is that the homology, this transform, is injective in 2D and 3D. We believe it's true for higher dimensions, but it's true in 2 and 3D. Now, if this is true, what you can say is I'm looking, going to look at the subspace of all shapes that have at most n vertices. Okay, so this is not so restrictive because if it's in a computer, it's going to have at most n vertices. Now, let's say I have a distribution or a density function over these, these, uh, these, these shapes, right? What we can say is that this persistent homology transform is a sufficient statistic for this density. And we can say the same thing for the Euler characteristic again. Now, what's interesting about saying it for the Euler characteristic is the following. Is a reason why a lot of people look at sufficient statistics is, in statistics, it relates to something called the exponential family, which means that if you take your parameters, do an inner product of that with the sufficient statistic, it has this very nice form. So you can write things in terms of inner products, right? Or transposes, if it's, right? So then I could actually write down a likelihood for these complicated surface models. Now, think about what we're doing. I have an Euler characteristic curve for each direction. So I have a curve for each direction. 
I've integrated it, it's a smooth thing. So now I can just take T discrete points of it, okay? So I have capital T for each curve. I have K curve. I think of this as a matrix. This is a capital K by capital T matrix. In a way, you know, that's lost almost no information about the original shape, okay? Now, given that matrix, what can I do? I can go back and I can model it as a matrix variant normal. So I've taken a quite a complicated shape, putting any type of coordinate system where that would be a pain. We've transformed it into a matrix and we've given it a likelihood function. And so this is what we're working with now. We're trying to manipulate and use these likelihood functions to do, I'll tell you in a second, but to do more modeling, okay? So this is just what I told you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry? Because this is the, okay, so so this, because it is, in a way, it's, a, it's like a normal distribution, right? It's just a normal distribution for a matrix, right? You're saying the columns have one particular mean, so you have one covariant structure going, you know, going between the curves, right? And you have one within the curve. Now, it could be that maybe the matrix variant normal isn't the best model. There might be other type of models, right? That might be better, and that's something we're trying to understand. But in a way, this is a simpler Okay, now this is something which is really interesting, which we've recently realized, and don't read this slide. It's, I mean, you can if you want to, but let me explain it to you. One of the things we've realized, if you have a bunch of objects, okay, and let's say they're in general positioning, which means they're not crazy symmetric, okay? Take the object, just take random directions. Take random directions along the sphere and get curves, okay? And what I'm telling you, the map from the object onto these random curves is injected. So you don't need to align the object. You just need to get the scale right. And if you just collect a distribution of curves for an object, a distribution of curves for another object, and if you can measure the distance between these distributions, you actually have a system where you can start looking about distances and reasoning about them without having to align them. Now, it may be better if you align them. We're not sure of this, but aligning these objects is a pain in the neck. So you know, we've, we, we have papers, we have software to do that as well. And that's, that's really, really kind of non-trivial. So that, that's kind of another interesting point. So let me show you some results. Um, I told you we have 106 primates. And what we did was we took this persistent homology transform. We took this distance measurement that I told you on it. And what am I getting? Uh, this is a bunch of distances. And this is multidimensional scaling, just plotting it in two dimensions. And then what you see are the uh, primates, non-human primates, kind of show up together. These are old world monkeys. They show up together. This is an extinct old world monkey. These are new world monkeys. Squirrel is actually a squirrel monkey. This is an extinct, again, new world monkey. And these are all lemur. And one of these, I think, is an extinct lemur, right? Um, so you start seeing kind of the structure that you would expect. We also did this on more controlled data. We did this on little shaped cartoons. Um, so this is what my colleague Doug made a much nicer picture using some software called PASC and kind of putting in the actual uh, phylog the phylogenetic group, uh, right, which are these different groups. So, so this is what it looks like there. Now he told us something which was interesting, which is at least in one way our method did better than the others in that the hylobates were linked with the other apes and previously the hylobates were linked with the aluada. I got this, I had no idea what the hell it meant. Uh, my wife's a biologist. She explained to me that it turns out that we got the gibbons near the primates. Previously, they were near, I think, the spider monkey. So, so this seemed good. Uh, more visually, this is what our method gave. This is what a classic shape statistic method would give. The classic shape statistic methods are based on, roughly speaking, take your object, put down a bunch of landmark points, put a perpendicular on each of these landmark points, write that down as a vector, as a matrix, right? Now, if I want to measure distance between these two, there's something called a Procrustes distance, which is how much the distance is to align these two matrices, nulling out rotation, translation, and scaling, okay? But for that, you need a fixed number of landmarks. This is using that type of approach, okay? And this is using an automatic place landmark approach, which is more like the conformal uh, mapping approach. So at least qualitatively, it looks like ours is better, but we need to do uh, more work on this. One of the things that I think is really exciting is that um, 
morphologists and also archaeologists are going from this collection of data and keeping them as landmarks, five points, six points, and distances between them, to doing CT scans of them. So we're getting a lot more data, which is much richer in these CT scans, which I think is really, really kind of interesting and exciting. So we've been asking this question. So I've started to think about shapes that are well, modeling surfaces and shapes, but you can ask the same about networks. So a problem that I got from my, from my wife is she studies baboons, and they have uh, collected behavioral networks, which are how much these baboons groom each other. And from the same troop, they have very, not on the same baboons, they have microbiome networks, how similar their microbiomes are. And you have a collection of these. And you want to say, how much does variation in one network explain variation in another network? So you can actually think about networks again as phenotypes. So how do we think about modeling them, right? And so you can ask the question of how can I think about a graph? So you can apply a similar idea. So this is one graph, this is another graph. There's something called the graph Laplacian, which is nothing but doing Fourier analysis on a graph, really. And what it does is it gives you different values on the graph node, right? Different kind of frequencies, different directions on the graph node. And so you can apply the same idea that I just told you to this graph, turn it into matrices, and you can ask the distance. So this is just doing perturbations of this graph. The red is perturbations of this other graph. And we're just looking at how these perturbations move through, in a way, perturbations of graph space. And then it's looking at you know, uh, a 2D projection of that. So, so that's one of the things we're working on. And we're trying to say, we know that we can't solve the graph isomorphism problem. We can't tell you how similar graphs are. But the question is, how far can you go? Modulo what invariant? Um, we're starting to do association studies. So these, I think, are brains of uh, sticklebacks. These are fish brains. Okay, and what we want to do is take these brains, use this type of approach, and then do a genome-wide association study to ask, you know, if variation in these shapes are they related to variation along particular genome, uh, particular variant. And here's another example. This is this idea of looking at the variation in uh, microbiome and networks of baboons. That's another thing we're working on. Um, I don't have data for this yet, but one very specific example is one of my colleagues at Duke. They did a huge sea urchin cross. So they took a bunch of sea urchins, they crossed them, and they did it under two different environmental condition, uh, conditions. And one of the things they did was they took pictures of the sea urchin embryo. So one of the things we want to understand is get estimates of heritability under these two environmental conditions. So that brings together the first part of the talk with the second part of the talk is we're building up more and more of these, using these methods to try to do quantitative genetics and statistical genetics of these shapes. So there's a lot of interesting and open questions. So one is, how do you automatically align these uh, surfaces? So we're thinking about that. Related to that, how do you get correspondence between points on them? That's interesting. So number three is a really interesting question, is that this idea of running the surface through a shape is, is the, crudely speaking, you can think of that as a form of integration. So the direction is an analog of a frequency you can think of. And then right now we're running it through the entire shape. That's a basis. You could look at local basing, right? And so this is a form of Euler integration. And you can, a signal processing question is, how many directions do you need for a particular shape? So this would be the analog of a sampling theory for surfaces or shapes. And then if you want to do this, you know, finer multi-scale, you can ask about more local versions of these. So I think kind of that, that, that's also an interesting question. Um, you can think about maps between networks, and then lastly, kind of combining the two parts of this talk. So more and more on how to do statistical and quantitative genetics of things that are surfaces or networks or these more complicated objects that we don't have a good coordinate representation of. So um, before I just, I think one of the ideas here is that sometimes when we try to model something, for me statistically, it might be really useful to think of them just not as an object, but maps between the objects and how those behave, right? So, so that's that. And thank you for listening. And there are people who funded this. So thanks a lot.
Jen, I have a question for yes. the statistical statistics you have is uh, comparing covariance metrics. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Then making an assumption of the population covariance function. So have you ever used that kind of for, for the shape? Yeah. yeah, we have. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example. This one. The, that is the, the Procrustes. The Procrustes, yeah. I mean, that's effectively what the Procrustes is doing. Modulo the rotation. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we have. The, I mean, the, the motivation partly for this was a case where that really breaks badly, right? If, if, if you have, you know, a new lobe on your butterfly yeah. or your, your fruit fly wing, right? Yeah. You can't. Your matrices, these matrices are not possible to Which one? Okay, so yeah, let me, bro. yes, you're right. So these matrices are not positive. So definitely. Tests. They are exactly. not. They're absolutely not. But they don't, they need not be. So the mean here, when you parameterize this, the mean is not positive, semi-definite, but the two covariance structures are. Okay. Okay? Okay. Thanks. Uh, very nice talk. So I have two quick questions on uh -huh. the first part. So the first one is, uh, so when you do the sparse factor analysis decomposition on the G and the E, both metrics, do you use the same loading matrix lambda for both of that or you use a different lambda? I forgot. I, 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 yeah, I went through that up. fast, right? Yeah. So uh, I use the same loading matrix. I see. Is yeah. there any explanation? Because you parameter. can do it. Pure I parameters. You, you could do them both separately. Uh -huh. It's more parameters. We didn't find that it uh -huh. did much better. So, but yeah, okay. that's a very reasonable question. Yeah, and then the second one is, yeah, you know, people are very interested in doing uh, multiple phenotype mapping association studies with the phenotype, or with the SNP. So you can imagine if you have hundreds of phenotypes, you can do as you do a factor analysis and uh, put the loading vector for a couple of first uh, few mm -hmm. vectors and do association study. Mm -hmm. So is your method scalable to accommodate thousands of individuals and do this kind of thing in standard GWAS studies? Um, okay, so let me let me repeat the the question is the shape things are that we're doing right? Can we do this for a thousand phenotypes and put it into a GWAS study? Um, I'll, let me tell you how we're envisioning to do it right now, and um, from that you can tell how scalable it will be, uh, or whether we need to do something smarter. So the way we do it right now is you take these matrices, right, which you've reduced the shape down to. You can measure distances between all of them, right? Now the easiest thing to do is take that and then basically do multiple dimensional scaling to turn those into vectors. Now that you have them as vectors, you go ahead and do your classical GWAS, right? So the question that really arises is how quickly can you turn these into a bunch of vectors, right? How quickly can you stack your vectors? How much uh, low dimensional structure is there across those vectors, right? To be able to do what you just said. And I don't know because I haven't done it yet, but I hope to do it soon. And then, but yeah. Oh, I just oh, there's one last thing that I want to say. This is maybe kind of cool or not. Um, this problem of of how many directions you need, right? There's a really related beautiful problem. Uh, it's called snake calculus. So if I give you a bunch of critical points for a curve, right? Let's say I don't know 20. I'll tell you where they are, and then I ask you, what is the cardinality of the number of functions, right, that can satisfy this? It has a beautiful kind of cosecant expansion, and this is work by V. I. Arnold, which is really gorgeous. But there's no generalization of this to multiple dimensions. So I'll stop there. Yeah, no, go ahead. Do you, do you use anything else than shape, like texture or something? The way we're doing it right now, we don't because um, we've been looking at bones, right? And and there's not that much texture, roughly, on bones. But you know, there are examples where you definitely want to. I'll give you an example. One of the GWAS studies we're looking at are the faces of 1,400 
Tanzanian children. And all of their hair has been cropped. Right? And the reason why their hair has been cropped is to take out texture. Right? And there are certain cases where you really wouldn't want to take out texture. Right? And for there, I think it's interesting. What do you do? Do you build a kind of a shape model and a texture model? Or, but I haven't gotten that far. Yet. Yeah. What about density additions to your model? So, so that wouldn't be hard to do. So that could be that could be done. Um, so, like I said, the way that we did things right now is you're just looking at the sublevel, basically looking at the meshes in the sublevel set, right? You could totally do all of these weighted. Right? There are ways of doing this weighted, and I think that would be extremely interesting. And that's why I think if you think a little bit of this as a signal processing more generally idea and think about what are good bases for this, I think there are a lot of interesting things you could do. China, you know, I have a question. Yes. Computer distance. And these are not really positive definite. Mm -hmm. So then how this like classical likelihood ratio statistics, like Bartlett statistics will work here? Well, you first, uh, yeah. Okay. So first of all, I, I, I don't do classical likelihood yeah. statistics. Sure. So, um, so, so you can measure, okay. So let's, let's, you have this matrix varied normal, right? I can yeah. measure distances between them. One way is I can measure the KL divergence between two different matrix variant normal. Sure. Right? So you can do that. Now, if you want to do something like, um, let's say you want to do something more like hypothesis testing, yeah. which I, I tend to avoid, but that's a religious issue. Um, what you can do is you can do a permutation test if you sure. have to. There are other things you can try to do. Okay. Right? I would be very, 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 very afraid of trying to do a likelihood ratio statistic to say something about one model versus another okay. model within okay. this context, because I, I have no idea how sensitive right, these okay. are to initial. Okay. You know, I mean, loosely speaking, this is what I've told you. What I've told you is there is a likelihood, there's a probability space on these surfaces, right? There's some density there. It's, uh, it's harder than hell to write down. It's a pain in the ass to write down. I have no idea how the hell to do it in general. So I've told you that I've given you a map, a deterministic map from that space in another space where I can write down some reasonable model. Okay? Yeah. Now, if I were a reasonable statistician, maybe I am sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> what I would be asking is, you have a likelihood model here. I have a push forward onto the likelihood model here. Right? What can I say about this from this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, you know, I can't give you an honest answer. Thank you. Thank you very much.